Hi guys, it's me Tazar HD and welcome to episode 52 of the podcast where today we're going to continue talking about some of the big talking points that we haven't really covered, you know, massively in depth as of yet in today's podcast episode. Hopefully you guys are doing well after the Mexican Grand Prix as of course the US Grand Prix is very close coming up this weekend. Of course, I'm going to bring on Nib right now and get his thoughts of what happened in the Mexican Grand Prix and continue the discussion. Nib, how you doing mate? And also, I know you were very tired during the weekend, uh, but have you recovered, kind of? Uh, yeah, I'm doing pretty well, and, uh, well, I'm certainly uh, a little bit recovered. I wouldn't say fully yet. My sleeping pattern is still quite uh, messed up, as we're now recording at nearly 2.30am uh, my time on Tuesday morning. Um, but, yeah, well, it was a really ant anticlimactic Mexican Grand Prix. It... You know, with the variant in strategies um, during the middle of the race, it looks like it could be set up for quite a, a good finish, but it just never eventuated really, did it? It was um, it was quite an anticlimactic race. There was no real overtakes um, like perhaps we thought there was. And yeah, honestly, it was, it was quite disappointing in the end. Yeah, it was. And if, if you're going to wake up early for a race, like I know you had to at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m., whatever time it was. Oh, I know didn't wake up for it <laughs> <laughs> um but if you're gonna be up at that time in the morning wherever you are in the world it has to be a good race if it's gonna you know really keep you up and interested in whatever's going on but yeah it wasn't the greatest race and i think to be honest it is kind of because of the track i don't think that it is because of the tires or the cars really i think if we had that similar situation to say the track we're racing at this weekend the circuit of america's i think we would have a very good end to the race, but that track isn't the greatest track for racing. But anyway, let's get into uh, what happened in Mexico and start off with, as what the title says, Ferrari gift Mercedes the win again. Ferrari obviously locked out the front row of Max Verstappen getting his penalty. They got away one and two, was very close at the start. Contact, of course, between Vettel and Leclerc and also Vettel almost pushed Lewis Hamilton off the track onto the grass and almost caused a massive crash. Uh, but then, yeah, one and two leading for the first 15 laps. They looked very comfortable. Yes, Albert and Hamilton were there, but they weren't really, you know, forcing Vettel or Leclerc to defend or anything like that. They were looking good. And then once Alex Albon pitted, Ferrari just progressively threw away the race. First off, Charles Leclerc. Pitting, one, way too early, and two, he pitted onto the wrong tyres. He should have gone onto the hard compound tyres. And if Ferrari actually paid attention to Albon's pit stop, because clearly Charles Leclerc's pit stop was a reaction to Alex Albon's pit stop. If they'd actually paid attention and not panicked, they would have clearly seen that Albon went from the mediums to the mediums, meaning Albon had to pit again. But they clearly didn't see that. And thought, right, we've got to react straight away, get Leclerc in, get on the mediums again, and, you know, do a two-stop when they didn't have to do that. They really were, no disrespect to Alex Albon, but they really were racing Lewis Hamilton for the race victory in Mexico. And with Charles Leclerc, gave him, one, the wrong tyres at his first stop, and the wrong strategy. And if you look at, as I've got on the screen right now, this um, lap time chart of Charles Leclerc's lap times compared to Sebastian Vettel's. Charles Leclerc was not way faster than Vettel in the first 15 laps, but Leclerc was faster. Now, yes, Charles Leclerc may have been struggling on his tyres a bit, but at the end of the day, if he's setting lap times that are good enough, considering what tyres he's on and the amount of fuel he's got, then there's no real point pitting him when you don't have to. So they got it wrong there. And then for Sebastian Vettel, it was a combination of not really... I think Ferrari didn't really know when to pit him, but also Sebastian Vettel wanted to stay out as long as possible to try and get an overcut, I guess. But it just simply didn't work. Uh, did not work, rather. And they gifted Lewis Hamilton the victory. And once again, Ferrari just gifted Mercedes another victory... Um, on a plate, yes, Lewis Hamilton drove very well and saved the tyres very well to win that race, no doubt about it, but Ferrari completely gifted them the race, and I do not understand how Inaki Rueda, their strategist, is still at Ferrari. Someone out there, please tell me why he is still at Ferrari, because there is no way a 
a proper winning team would continue with someone like that. He, there is no way he should be at that team anymore. And with the amount of mistakes he's made and races and points he's cost the team, I don't get how he is the strategist. Nib, is there any explanation in your opinion that could explain why Anaki Rueda should be at Ferrari and, you know, for the future? Because I just don't see how a team that wants to win world championships would persist with such an awful strategist. Um, well, he, he did make a good couple of uh, strategy calls, um, well, only a couple of races ago. Um, in Singapore, it was pretty good. I can't, I can't remember the other race um, where he made a good strategy call. But yeah, I thought yesterday was, uh, was really, really questionable uh, strategy by Ferrari. Uh, we seen seen very early on that the hard compound of Ty was performing super, super well. We seen it with uh, Daniel Ricciardo. He had a fantastic start to the Grand Prix and was very, very quick, quicker than those on the medium tyres in the midfield than anyone else. And he was on the hard compound of tyre. So I think that they had evidence to show that the hard compound of tyre was, was better. Obviously, they pitted Leclerc way, way too early. Um, and as you mentioned, it was, of course, a reaction to Albon. And they and they followed him onto the medium compound of tyre. But I think most of us thought that it was going to be a two-stop going into that race. I could sort of understand why, but still, it was ultimately the wrong decision. Um, to to go onto the onto the medium compound of the tires, and then with Vettel, yeah, well that that was uh that's what happens when Sebastian Vettel doesn't have confidence in the strategy that he actually then creates the strategy himself. Um, I think I think that's the perfect example of how he doesn't really have trust in Ferrari's strategy. Obviously, he felt um good on those tires, and those tires were really in really in good condition, but um. I think at Mexico, it's super important to have track position and with Ferrari being such a hard car to overtake um, in a straight line, of course, because they have that super rocket power, super light speed engine in the back of their car. Um, I, I don't understand why they didn't respond to Hamilton pitting and and just letting him go through. So, yeah, um, it was questionable by Ferrari. I don't think it's probably the worst decision, like worst strategy mistakes that they've made, but certainly... Um, Certainly some poor decisions yesterday on the pit wall by Ferrari. But um, with Rueda, um, as you were saying earlier on, he did make a couple, I guess, good decisions. But honestly, I think he, I think the reason they look good is because he's so used to making bad decisions. We actually thought it was good <laughs> because, you know, for a team, normally that's just a normal, understandable decision. But for Rueda, is there any reason why you can think that he's still at Ferrari? Um, not particularly, if I'm perfectly <laughs> honest. Um, you know, obviously he's made more bad strategy calls than what he has good. Um, that that's pretty obvious. But I I don't know. Um, uh, obviously precisely why he's still at Ferrari. You know, I think we've been. I think you've you have especially been calling for his head for quite some time now. Um, <laughs> but you know that's obviously Ferrari's decision and uh we'll see if they do eventually make a decision on Inaki Ueda's um future um perhaps for next season yeah and they've got to and yeah i've been calling for his head since i think the summer of 2018 because he's been making i think really since 2018 started that's really when his decision making was shown up to be so incredibly poor cuz i think it was Shanghai, Baku, and Spain of 2018. Three races in a row where he made poor strategy decisions, which cost Vettel, really, um, the chance at the time to go and win those races. But I will say, and I said this, I think, in my race review, or maybe the end of my race watch, I'm going to say it again. Ferrari will never win a world championship with him as their strategist, because even if they have the fastest car, with him in that role... They will find a way to cock it up and somehow lose a victory when they should comfortably get it. So they've got to get rid of him. It, it, it is as simple as that. But when it comes to poor strategy, we have to, of course, mention Albon as well with Red Bull. But as you kind of said there, Nib, I think the teams were kind of expecting it to be a two-stop race. So you can kind of understand Albon's um pit stop from medium to medium so early on but ultimately it obviously didn't work but i will say albin did drive pretty well but of course uh, max verstappen his teammate 
was really in the wars all weekend, getting uh, a grid penalty in qualifying for not obeying yellow flags, going off for of Lewis Hamilton uh, on the first lap, then getting a puncture after dive bombing Valtteri Bottas, and really, from a PR perspective, it wasn't exactly the greatest weekend uh, for Max Verstappen in terms of his reputation and. I think definitely the community, the F1 community, is not looking upon Max Verstappen in that good of a way. And I know Nibby didn't really get to see that much of qualifying, but I'm guessing you got to see some of his comments and what happened in qualifying. And of course, you saw what happened in the race. What did you make of Max's weekend and how he conducted himself? Because I personally thought it was quite poor at times. Yeah, well, I didn't exactly, uh, I didn't watch qualifying, I only caught up on the highlights, but yeah, obviously I've seen that he just continued on um, with Bottas in the wall, and I, and I you know, Max he has that absolute killer instinct, but, you know, you got to know when to switch that killer instinct off, and that and that was the time to switch it off, and then of course, um, he's like, I'll oh, just delete the lap time, but he could clearly see the double wave yellows. Um, obviously, I didn't see too many much of his comments, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, but then, obviously, he was very aggressive in the race. Um, well, especially with his over attempted overtake on Bottas, which he got dumped. But you know, it was such a, a big lunge up the up the inside at the hairpin in the stadium section that Bottas really, or Bottas did extremely well to not create a well. Well, to cause much of a bigger crash than uh, than what happened. Of course, there was a little touch which gave him the puncture. But yeah, it was just it during the race that reminded me of Reckless Max um, from like pre Monaco in tw in twenty eighteen. If I'm perfectly honest with you, um, it just it settles if he uh, he wasn't in check of his emotions. If I'm perfectly honest, in the cockpit um, during the Grand Prix. Obviously, after that incident, incident he had that. Um, little incident with Kevin Magnussen as well, where he just completely uh, went off circuit and overtook him. Um, so yeah, it was, certainly wasn't Max's great race, but you know, I'm sure that Max will will re reevaluate and come back uh, much stronger at the at the United States Grand Prix. I hope he does because we want to see Max Verstappen at his best because normally that's when we do get some uh, great battles at the front and races. But yeah, it was very early 2018 type Max Verstappen um, getting, as you said, too hot under the collar and just making reckless mistakes. And even though I think on the first lap he couldn't do that much, he definitely was pushing very hard to get past Hamilton. And then I think he probably could have waited to pass Valtteri Bottas at a later or better point um, in the Grand Prix because that ultimately him passing him there did cause him... Of course, the puncture with Valtteri not really able to do that much. But yeah, hopefully he bounces back at the US Grand Prix. And don't uh, worry, guys. We will get onto in a moment the uh, Verstappen illegal overtake on Kevin Magnussen because that was so clear to see. But before we get into that, we need to really praise Daniel Ricciardo. Of course, Max Verstappen's ex-teammate. And Daniel Ricciardo's performance in the Mexican Grand Prix was... So incredibly good. 51, I think, laps on the hard compound tyre. And his pace, as you'll see on the screen now, this is a comparison between Hulkenberg and Ricardo's lap times from when Hulkenberg pitted on lap 18 to when Ricardo pitted. Now, if you look at the times, as Hulkenberg, you know, his lap times get faster, Ricardo is about a quarter of a second faster each time. So when Hulkenberg is lapping in the... Late 1 minute 21s, Ricardo is in the mid 1 minute 21s, and then later on towards lap 50, 40 ish. Um, once Hulkenberg gets down to a mid 121, then Ricardo is getting into the low 1 minute 21s. Now, again, Nico Hulkenberg had 18 laps uh, fresher tyres, I think, fresher hard tyres than Daniel Ricardo had. So, that performance, I have to say, was absolutely incredible by Daniel Ricardo. And even though he didn't get Perez at the end, for me, he was clearly driver of the day. And honestly, I thought that was one of the best performances Daniel Ricciardo's put in in the last couple of years. It was so, so good after what was a horrible qualifying and nib. Um, well, Ricciardo, what did you, on reflection, think of the performance overall? And would you say it's probably his best of the season? I think it's probably his best of the season. Yeah, certainly off the top of my head, one of his best performances of the season. And 
certainly uh, one of the best starts I've seen uh, so far from, from Ricardo this season. Uh, even though you're starting on the hard compound tie and everyone else around was on the soft and medium, he actually didn't lose places off the start, which, of course, if you're Australian, you lose places off the start. <laughs> it's just what happens. Um, I don't know why that is, but, you know, we just have awful starts, no matter who it was, whether it was Webber and now Ricardo, we're uh, absolutely awful. So he actually had a good start for once and made up positions. He was up in P10 um, after a couple of laps and yeah, his race pace was really terrific. And as you can see on screen, he was, uh, he was quicker than Hulkenberg on the majority of the race, even though Hulkenberg was on fresher tires. And it just shows that, uh, that Ricardo indeed did have a, a very good race and quite, arg- uh, quite arguably and um, off the top of my head, probably his best race for, for Renault so far. Yeah, definitely. Canada was also very good, but I think considering the circumstances, with what's been going on at Renault lately, um, I think Ricardo's performance in Mexico was probably the best of 2019, and he thoroughly deserved the points finish he got. But talking about Renault's difficult time, let's go into that because a couple more bits of news came out about this whole brake bias system that they've been using, and Renault have been very defensive <laughs> over it. And they actually came out during the weekend and said that they've been using it for plenty of years. Um, and in my opinion, because they've come out and admitted that, and also Roman Grosjean said that when he was at Lotus, which of course was a team before the Renault Works team at Enstone, he said they were using it then. So in my opinion, because of that, surely there should be a further investigation into Renault, but I'm not um, at the moment seeing one. So until I make my full video on it, I'm not quite going to say what I think really should happen i think there should be an investigation but i'm not going to say what should happen after that but i just want to ask nib uh one do you think renault should be investigated after they admitted that they've had this on their car before 2019 but also do you think they will realistically be further investigated or, or do you think their disqualification at suzuka is it um more than likely i'd say that just their disqualification at suzuka because it was more of a, a technicality it they were said it was it was, it, it, it was. It's a very. It was very weird. It was ac- It was within the rules, but it wasn't. You know how they have these silly grey areas because they can't make perfectly clear rules. Um. So no, I don't think that they will go back and get any sort of penalty. They might. They might investigate it, but I don't think that they will face any further action. I think that the uh, disqualification from. Uh, the the Japanese Grand Prix uh, will probably be it, but if uh, they've been running it since 2015, it's quite incredible that um they've only picked up on it now. And of course, uh, I think Racing Point said that they noticed it uh during like the onboard lap of their of their breakdown of their first run of the car in uh in Spain early this year. So yeah. um quite remarkable to actually to to see that they've been running it for so long and for the teams and the FIA to only pick up on it now. Yeah, and also I saw the GoPro and it is clear to see that they were using that system and Daniel Ricciardo, I think it was driving, was not, um, you know, changing the brake bias himself. So it was pretty clear to see. But yeah, I I think there probably should be an investigation to it. I, I don't think that they will get a, you know, a disqualification from the championship because as you said, it's, it's a very small... Um, you know, breaking of the rules, I guess, compared to what it has been in the past. But it's very weird that Renault have come out and admitted that the FIA have found it, you know, so long to, you know, find something like this. And also, because Renault have been using it since 2015 when they were Lotus and, you know, now Renault, it would be interesting to find out if any other teams are using it, because I'm sure there must be another team that's using it if they have been, um, you know, in Formula 1 at the moment. Anyway... Talking of Renault, let's talk about one of their other drivers, Nico Hülkenberg. And, of course, he got took out at the end of the race by Daniel Kvyat. And we, I didn't analyse this in the incident analysis, but I just want to say quickly as I show the screenshots. It's pretty clear to see Daniel Kvyat going to the final corner. Hülkenberg's clearly ahead and Daniel just torpedoes him into the wall. And Daniel deserved the penalty he got. And Hülkenberg, luckily for him, finished in P10, but it should have been P9. Because, uh, of course, Gasly finished ahead of him with Hülkenberg stopping uh, just after the end of the race. But, talking of earlier on, the Max Verstappen illegal overtake on, Ma- on Kevin Magnussen. I'm showing it now on the screen, but how on earth 
Considering this was shown on TV, how on earth did the FIA stewards not penalise Max Verstappen? How? It's so clear. He drives off the track and rejoins ahead. It's a clear overtake. I cannot believe the stewards are this bad when it comes again to applying the rules. They're so poor at the moment. I have to say the stewards, since Charlie Whiting sadly passed away earlier this year, the stewards, in terms of the decisions they've made, but also their operational side of things, they have been very poor. But how this wasn't a penalty, I have no idea. Nib, can you think of any reason why the stewards would not have given them a penalty or even investigated it? I have literally no idea. First of all, Max Verstappen initiated the contact between himself and Kevin Magnussen by uh, just slightly touching his rear end and then just completely drove off the circuit and overtook him. I can't remember if uh, which way around was it, but Vettel and Button at, Ho at, uh, at Hockenheim um, a couple of years back now. And then whoever did that got a penalty for it. It's pretty much the exact same thing what they've done there. Just completely gone off circuit and overtook him. And they they... Did they they noted the investigation, but they didn't they didn't take any action. I I I don't understand. Yes, because he's in a Red Bull doesn't mean he just is able to overtake cars because he likes to in whatever way possible. I I'm I I don't know how. Um, I don't know how he hasn't got a penalty for that. And quite honestly, absolutely, um, disgraceful stewarding there. Yeah, it absolutely is. I do not understand. Every time I look back at it, I just sit there and think, how on earth has this not been you know, given as a penalty? Like, it makes me think that I may be going crazy because I think this is a penalty, but the stewards who are supposed to be, I guess, the professionals in making decisions cannot get this simple thing right. It's so incredibly bad, but yeah. The stewards, again, really poor decisions, but in 2019, that has really been the theme of the season. But before we go, uh, we're going to quickly have a quick look ahead to the US Grand Prix. Now, my preview for the US Grand Prix will come out on Thursday, so I will give my thoughts for the teams then. So I'll let Nib uh, give his thoughts uh, going into the US Grand Prix. Nib, uh, for all the teams, what do you expect to happen and what are your predictions for the race? Well, well, I actually I haven't really uh, thought too much about the uh, the USA Grand Prix because I don't think I'll be able to watch the race, unfortunately, due to the the time it's on. Um, but yeah, I think that it's obvious. I think it's going to be a showdown between uh, Ferrari and Mercedes once more. I don't think Red Bull will be quite there. They just seem to be lacking a bit of pace. Um, uh, ever since uh, Hockenheim, really, I think that was the last time that Red Bull were actually really properly quick. Um like throughout the whole entire race, um, obviously when Verstappen won in the, in the Kaudic, uh German Grand Prix there. So yeah, I, I don't think Red Bull will be there. Obviously, I think that this will be a much better Grand Prix than the Mexican Grand Prix. I don't think we've actually had an absolute stinker of a race in Austin over the years. We've always had good races. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd probably give the edge to Ferrari because of how uh, long the straight is and, the, and they're pretty good in the fast corners. Um, so I think that Ferrari will take pole, but of course in the race, Mercedes just have so much better tire wear uh, than Ferrari. So that will be, of course, where uh, Mercedes uh, win or lose the race. Oh, sorry, where well, obviously Ferrari and Mercedes win or lose the race uh, will be with the tire wear uh, in the midfield. Obviously, um, obviously, we didn't touch on it, but McLaren they were so awful in the Mexican Grand Prix. Obviously, they had that nightmare of a pit stop um with lando norris but once when science pitted he got overcut by i say undercut by kiviat and then everyone pitted uh later than him and just comfortably come out ahead i don't know what on earth happened to mclaren in that race so they'll be looking to bounce back and i think they will bounce back i think they'll have another strong result and uh hopefully for for daniel ricardo of course uh the driver who i support as i am australian um i think that I think hopefully Renault will have a have a bit stronger of, of a qualifying session, and if they can do that, uh, then I think that they will uh, score some solid points because they they seem to have a good car in the race. Um, the last two races in Suzuka and of course um, at just in the last Grand Prix, the Mexican Grand Prix, they've had very strong uh, race pace and come through and got some points. Of course, they're disqualified in Suzuka, but 
Still hope for Renault. Um, Toro Rosso were quite impressive during the Mexican Grand Prix, so I think that they will be up there again. Sergio Perez, who had a very good drive, I think hasn't gotten enough credit for his drive um, on the weekend. Um, I don't know if he'll have such a strong result. He always seems to 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 bring out an extra couple of tenths for his home fans there in uh, in Mexico, but don't know if uh, him and the Racing Point boys will be able to replicate that result there. Alfa Romeo, they're dead slow. Like, they're absolutely awful at the moment, so I don't think they will be scoring any points. Of course, Williams are Williams, Haas are Haas, so they'll be awful, but... Uh, moving on to my to my very early predictions, I think that Lewis Hamilton will win the race and will secure his sixth world title, bringing him in one championship closer to equaling Michael Schumacher's record of seven world championships. Uh, probably second, I'm going to go for Charles Leclerc. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to go Sebastian Vettel, actually. I think Vettel has been very impressive the last couple of races, and I think that... Um, Vettel is just a little bit better at Austin. I don't remember Leclerc actually having a super standout performance here uh, last year. So I think that I think that uh, that Vettel will finish second, and then in third, I'm going to go with Leclerc. I think Charles Leclerc will finish in third place. So those are my very very rough and very early um, Austin predictions. Uh, sadly, I won't be on the race watch long because I have an exam early that day. I'll say later that day. Um, and I want to make sure my sleeping pattern's all good. So sadly, I won't be on for the race watch long, but I hope uh, all of you guys enjoy the watch long and enjoy the race. So yeah, th- those are my very early predictions for the uh, for the USA Grand Prix. Absolutely. And yeah, he won't be on the race watch long, but I think we can all understand that uh, that is way more important than uh, watching the US Grand Prix. But uh, that is it for the podcast, guys. Episode 52, Nib. Thanks for coming on, mate. And as you said, you won't be on this weekend, but you'll be on the podcast uh, this time next week. And and we'll probably just cover everything in the US Grand Prix next week. But yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. And yeah, we'll see you next week. Yeah, of course, mate. Thanks for having me on as usual. And I hope everyone who tunes in uh, has a very good week leading up to the the United States Grand Prix. And uh, yeah, have a good week. Yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. And uh, before I go, just want to say what is coming up on the channel this week. So on Thursday, preview for the US Grand Prix. That'll be coming out at 12 p.m. UK time. And then I will be live at 7.30 p.m. UK time for Practice 2, for the Practice 2 watch along for the US Grand Prix. Then because qualifying is at 10 p.m. UK time on Saturday, I'll be live at 9 p.m. UK time through until about 11.30 p.m. UK time for qualifying. And then, of course, after that will be the qualifying review around midnight. And then we'll be live for the race watch along at around the same time we were for Mexico, 10 past 6 p.m. UK time. I think the race does start at 10 past 7 p.m. UK time. So, yeah, we'll be live then. And then, of course, the race review will come out after that. And then the incident analysis will come out on Monday. And then, yeah, this time next week, it will be the podcast where because that's the next time Nib is on, we'll just review what happened in the Grand Prix. So hopefully you guys can subscribe for that content coming up bottom right of the screen. You can do it right there or go to my homepage and uh, do it there and hit the notifications bell. And also hit the like button as well. It does help out the channel grow. Comment down below what you thought of this video and what you thought of what we had to say in this video. Don't forget to join my Discord, link below in the description. That's the best place for notifications of my videos and streams. Follow me on Twitter at Chaz6110. Like my Facebook page, that's ChazRHDF1 on Facebook. And as well, check out my website, ChazRHD.com, for more content like this. But guys, until my preview on Thursday, and until the next podcast next week, reviewing the US Grand Prix, it has been me, ChazRHD. Goodbye.